Welcome to Queer 20 by Ego Monk. It is the annual celebration of 20 queer Indians who have made an exceptional mark in the fields of business, technology, science, entertainment, etc. Today we are joined by Tejasvi Subramanian, a European journalist and researcher who is currently the editor of Casey Family, a queer owned, queer run media platform, and creates and curates sex ed content for that sassy thing. They are also a consultant to queer sexuality and disability practice. So Tejasvi, you operate in the intersections of queerness, neurodivergence and <laughs> relationship anarchy. What was the greatest challenge you had to personally overcome while navigating these labels? I think uh, the greatest challenge, so to speak, is just accessing the vocabulary for me to understand that I don't necessarily fit into or I don't necessarily feel inclined to fit into certain norms, which is heteronormative, compulsory monogamous norms and to find the vocabulary that speaks to another side which I can relate to and then also the next challenge which I'm still to be honest unraveling is understanding what practice looks like in a world which does not really like through its systems does not really acknowledge it does not really um, give space for it or make space for it or does not really in fact actively penalize it does not incentivize that kind of practice so yeah, those are broadly the challenges that I face uh, in my practice, in my relational practice, in my identity. What do these labels uh, mean to you, if I have to put it that way? I think these labels are important because like I said, it gives me and people like me the vocabulary to really like articulate our experiences and also get in touch with a part of ourselves which has actively been portrayed as not normal, portrayed as undesirable. So um, that's what these labels mean, like queerness does not always have to be that I'm attracted to a certain gender or sexuality or sexuality does not have to take those forms necessarily, which is why I always tell people I'm like, it's more about being in touch with your queerness, it's more about being in touch with parts of you that have been declined and denied to you by society, by norms, by um, certain ideas of uh, you know that are colonial in uh, their nature and things like that so that's what these labels really mean to me and that's why it helps to use these labels for myself i don't necessarily think it helps me set myself apart from others but it helps me articulate about my personal life philosophy or ideology that is different from what we've been ta taught as desirable and normal so to speak. i'm not sure if i have advice for people besides that um, what I would say is that be in touch with your body because like there's this idea that there is this idea and there is this experience that a lot of our intelligence is stored within our own bodies and we are constantly told to distance ourselves from our bodies for instance like it starts from something like in school where we said that you pee during the breaks you don't pee during my class um, you don't um, like stimming, you don't really shake your leg because it's disrespectful, you don't sit a certain way, you have to wear certain kinds of clothes only for it to be seeming like you are in a place of learning or a professional setting etc etc. If you are uncomfortable, that is something that you have to lean into your discomfort and say I am uncomfortable, these clothes are making me uncomfortable, this posture is making me uncomfortable, to hold my pee in is making me uncomfortable uh, because systems will actively try to say things like mind over matter and things like that, mind over body and things like that. So it's not necessarily um, something that I, there's an advice that I can give it to you. You have to listen to your own body and to your own self for that kind of advice to learn more about yourself because that's what led me to finding about my own queerness and unraveling like, my own neurodivergence for instance. That A lot of that was, you know, feelings and emotions stored within my body that I had probably shrouded in some amount of shame, some amount of um, disgust, some amount of also like shyness to say that okay this is not acceptable so I cannot show these parts of myself but slowly as I built that community and I built that space for myself and obviously other people have built that space for me I'm able to do that so yeah so lean into your body and lean into your own sense of queerness which basically means adjusting yourself to what you need instead of what others tell you that you need. Um, so that actually summarizes a lot that a lot of uh, people are thinking. 
Uh, so in that context, for someone struggling with a diagnosis or labeling journey when it comes to neurodivergence, what would be your advice? I think what we do in our society is we position sexual interactions as some sort of like, there's a pious nature to it. It's almost considered sacred, which it is, but it is also considered that monogamy, monogamy, a practice of monogamy in a sexual interaction is sacred. There is also this uh, idea that partnership, marriage, is kind of has to be consummated through sexual interaction. Uh, what I see is that there is a lot of emphasis on sex and the prime. There is a primariness of a relational aspect yeah. that comes from sexual interaction and sexual engagement with another person. And I think that is the culprit, not like allosexual people who want to have sex are not the culprit. People who don't want to have sex are not the culprit. And there are asexual people who like to have sex as well. And there are asexual people who are sex repulsed. Recently I read on uh, the swaddle that asexuality is about decentering sex and nothing has made more sense to me. You know, asexuality is not just about a personal identity. It's also a personal philosophy for me where I say that sexual interaction does not necessarily mean that there is a hierarchy to relationships. You know, there's this hierarchy that if you have sexual interaction with the person, there is sort of primacy to it. There is sort of, you know, uh, it's also expected to that you don't have sex with more than one person and therefore that forms the, uh, the pinnacle of the charmed circle. You know? The charmed circle is this idea that there are, there are certain identities that are charmed, that are seen as more desirable and one of them is obviously couplehood, especially if you're cishet and especially if you're of the same Savarna caste, then that's great. And you have kids, you have the white picket fence dream of what our society uh, you know, our society's interpretation of a white picket friend's dream. So, um, yeah, so our idea of uh, allosexuality also comes from a lot of these other ideas, you know, that says that uh, sex has to be with a person of the opposite gender, sex has to be only with that person. And when you have sex with that person, there are other forms of partnership that you build with them. And without that, you can't really um, call that a partnership or call that a relationship of uh, value in your life. And that is my main gripe with allosexuality. I don't, I don't think sex is that big a deal to me, uh, in the sense that, yes, um, sex is sacred, and some with some people, sex is sacred. There is sort of like trust and intimacy to it, but not all sex is similar. And sex also, what does that mean? There's this cultural notion of sex which says, you know, penetrative sex is only sex that is valid. That is only way of consummation. Uh, so a lot of ideas feed into this, you know this uh, narrative of uh, allosexuality, which is what asexuality challenges and which is what my identity of being an ace person challenges. So uh, in a society that continues to remain confined by allosexuality, uh, the word asexual is heavily misrepresented. Uh, can you shed some light on identifying as an asexual person? I think my idea of asexuality is also very much shaped by my being autistic in that I am for the most part, I am someone who is repulsed by touch and not by all touch, but touched by strangers. I hate it, for instance, in public spaces when people like brush against me or, you know, do certain repeated motions and, you know, it's just, it, it bothers me. And uh, a lot of people don't respect that because they're just like, we are in a crowded space, this is what happens. But it is overwhelming me, it's bothering me. It, can lead to me lashing out and similarly that translate in, translates into what is known as I guess hookup culture in urban India and it's not something that I could really like relate to it's not something that I could feel myself practicing and that doesn't come from me being a prude which is also okay but I am not uh, and it doesn't come from my being um, sex repulsed you know I am someone who is sex positive I like the idea of sex I like engaging in sex but I don't necessarily like the idea of uh, touch being done th with me by strangers. There has to be a certain amount of trust building or we could uh, explore sexual interactions in myriad ways, which also like through technology is made possible. So we don't necessarily have to perform sex the way we have been culturally taught to. And uh, yeah. I think that's where my ace comes from. I do, also, I do not feel sexual attraction. I do not feel like Un unless there are certain circumstances, for instance, like kink helps me, uh, emotional intimacy helps me, and all of these require some amount of trust and intimacy, and you know a certain level of agency in that space, which is often not afforded to me um, because of my being seen as a cis woman, my being seen as a heterosexual person, 
um so yeah and in, we don't have those kind of nuanced conversations uh, unfortunately in our dating uh, you know in our dating ecosystem um hookup culture is not really unpacked for its various dynamics of gender caste um and so much more so and even like socio economic location geographical location uh, although the medical and academic understanding of autism has grown exponentially but there's a stereotypical media portrayal of what it means to be autistic uh, did this affect your journey of self acceptance and accepting autism uh my main gripe with uh, autistic portrayal in mainstream media especially visual media is that masking is never portrayed at all like i have never seen an autistic person on screen who is masking and you know for them to have a different experience a different space where they feel safer to not mask and to be their authentic self and this is a reality for so many of us who are autistic uh and neurodivergent in various other ways um and masking is also seen as manipulative and there is this idea that neurodivergent people have to be virtuous cute people only and like while we sure we are virtuous and we are cute like i will take that but i am also someone who has seen the world treat certain people a certain way and i don't want to be treated that way and therefore i've developed this coping mechanism which might be manipulative but it is also like a coping mechanism at the end of the day and i have never seen anybody on screen who is autistic of any gender um who has actively portrayed that you know that dilemma of masking and not masking is and what safety means to them whereas in real life me and a lot of other autistic people who i know who are my friends or family i have seen that they do not mask in certain spaces where they feel safe and they actively share that whereas in certain spaces where they do not they do not feel like they have that kind of control or agency they actively mask and that is something that we have to unpack to understand autistic presentation and yeah i i think that's so important but it isn't necessarily explored almost at all um, in media uh, so you openly recognize the savanna privilege you have against the intersections what role does that privilege uh, play in your allyship i think the best way best use of privilege is to just pass the mic you don't know a lot of things if you have a certain privilege for instance i am i have caste privilege i'm from i'm i'm from a savarna background and i am never going to experience casteism or maybe even my experience of casteism is going to be very minimal or very superficial which can be quickly clarified by saying hey but i have a savarna background and for instance when i was looking for a house very clearly there was one house owner who asked me about certain questions and they, he didn't outright ask me what my caste was he said oh where are you from where are your parents from where are your grandparents from Oh, they lived in this part of the city. Which city? Ah, uh, which uh, part of the city? Oh, that means that's a very Brahminical area. No, okay, okay. So, especially if your grandparents managed to live there, that obviously means you have that kind of caste background. And they are not very direct, but there's a different way of reading caste. So, I'm not going to experience the kind of casteism that somebody else might face uh, because of their caste background, because of being from certain oppressed caste communities. And uh, yeah, the best I can do is pass with the mic and say that, hey, I think. this person would be a uh, valuable valuable addition to this panel to kind of speak to this perspective and yeah that's the best thing you can do with your privilege because you're going to be invited to certain spaces regardless of uh, whether you like it or not like for instance i have been invited to be part of this um you know this pa- platform and maybe in a conversation later i can always say i think there are other queer people that i know who are also of like certain uh, other backgrounds who would be able to speak to the anti caste perspective a lot more than i i can like a lo- anti caste for me as a practice is something that is building you know like that is something that is um that i am building and i can't i can't necessarily say i'm anti caste in a in a sense that it is my way of being because there are certain ways in which i move through the world where i totally take advantage of my caste privilege so as someone who loves to read uh, could you give us your top three picks for someone looking to deepen their understanding of queer identity i have some books here uh, from my bookshelf right here that i have been reading over the past year or so and that i really enjoy and that also speak to my queer identity and one of them is in the dream house by carmen uh, machado uh carmen maria machado was a an author that a friend of mine recommended because of my love for horror and especially queer horror and they gifted me um a book of uh, short stories written by them 
and then I was so enamored by the author that I requested another friend of mine to give this book to me for my birthday and that's what they did. Um, it's a lovely book. It speaks about how relationships play out not just between two people but in the liminal and liminal space between them and also spatially you know um, and that's the beauty of it you really have to read the book it can't really be summarized in words um, the other book that I'm reading right now is A Small Step in a Long Journey it's a memoir by Akai Padmashali uh, she's a trans woman and uh, yeah it's it's, in fact, I'm reading it along with another book, which is um, The Truth About Me by A. Revati. So both these people are trans women who are from Bangalore, which is where I live and I have lived for almost a major portion of my adult life. And I owe so much of my identity, identity and discovery of it to this city. So I wanted to read about what it meant to be a trans person in this city before I came into my own transness in this city. And that's what both of these books mean to me. I have started reading this one. I haven't yet started on this one, but I feel like these will feed into each other. And yeah, uh, once again, spatially, you know, it tells me about how transness is performed in a city like Bangalore. The last book, sorry, I have to dust off a little because I haven't opened it in a few months, but I'm reading it nonetheless. It's called The Transition Baby. Uh, this is actually my friend's book and I have to return it to them at some point and it is such a cool book because it talks about why certain people need to make certain decisions about their body and their lives but that does not necessarily negate their identity or that does not mean they are in confusion about their identity and it's a deeply relatable book for me uh, because of how I see my own body and my own transness and yeah those are four books that I can think of that I have been reading and they're all queer and they all actually speak to trans or queer relationships and uh, yeah. Who is a queer role model? I don't have queer role models. I think uh, in fact a lot of my queerness has come out in community with other queer people in real life and they're people my own age. So more than queer role model, I believe in queer community. Uh, any favorite queer queer characters on screen? I really like May Martin, and uh, they were on a show which they wrote and produced, and that was my favorite. Uh, I really related to that a lot, and I enjoyed how uh, they used comedy to talk about their identity and to express themselves, and to also like as a coping mechanism for their trauma. So I really like that representation. Uh, best thing about being queer. Best thing about being queer is uh, finding queer joy in community, finding other people and finally find, being able to speak about our experiences and our desires and our relationships with our bodies with them. That has to be, that is so liberating and you know, like even as I speak about that, I can feel that joy in my body right now. One thing that scares you the most? One thing that scares me the most uh, has to be how I now am old enough to call myself a you know, or seeing myself as a queer elder person. Uh, I think as a queer person, I've always like, um, I found myself almost like trapped, so to speak, to use that kind of uh, terminology, but I found myself, I'm very comfortably trapped in a space where I'm always a teenager, I'm always driven by hormones, <laughs> or you know, uh, certain knee jerk uh, responses to de uh, desire and things like that. But I'm 30 and I'm going to turn 31 in fact and I, I now see that I am older than what I had ever imagined myself to be. I thought I would die by 28 for some reason but yeah so to now shape myself that is that is intimidating but it's also this it's also thrilling um, in a certain way. One thing that inspires you? Nature inspires me. Um, I think being around plants and animals inspires me the most. I don't know why but around them I can just be who I am and I am, I feel truly beautifully witnessed in, in an intimate and authentic way that I'm so I'm slowly trying to build with human beings also, but yeah, they have been constant in my life, plants and animals. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I'll share some words with you uh, and you share your immediate reaction. Uh, whatever comes to your mind, the first thing that comes to your mind uh, when you hear that word. 
workplace equity equity is a utopian ideal that we are trying to achieve through inclusion but yeah i think it's a utopian ideal what we really need to do is focus on belonging and focus on community allyship if you have to constantly label yourself an ally then it's performative it's practice more than a label or an identity you can't use ally you can't call keep calling yourself an ally that's not an identity journalism journalism is a very colonial profession according to we are all journalists we are all storytellers uh, there are no specific storytellers and that's what journalism possesses itself to be so yeah politics politics is an everyday way of life it's human reactions and human community it's human life reacting and responding to each other to build community and that's what is politics in its most rudimentary form india a nation state that's all i can say <laughs> thank you so much for your time uh, it was uh, really a pleasure to talk to you today